All right. Thanks again for joining today. Um, I've already given you my background, but I'm going to say it again just because we're recording this and we're going to split it apart. So my name is Dan Ross. I'm a strategic advisor for the public sector at Ecopia. Prior to my time with Ecopia, I served 28 years in the public sector in technical and leadership roles related to information management and GIS. Ten of those years were as the GIO for Minnesota. We're talking about the important role that GIS and geospatial data can play in a pandemic. This conversation will apply to other matters of public health as well. Joining me today is Frank Winters, former GIO from New York and chair of the National Pandemic GIS Task Force. Welcome, Frank, and thanks for joining today. You led an effort to bring folks together during the recent COVID-19 pandemic to try to understand and put together ideas and information for how GIS and geospatial data can benefit efforts to understand and respond to a pandemic. Can you share a little bit more about the genesis of the pandemic GIS task force and the role they play? Sure. Uh, first, I'll um, start with saying thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that fine introduction. How'd I do, Shelby? All right, I was listening. Um, sure, it's, a, it's really been an interesting um, uh, kind of an evolution here. But it was clear early on in the pandemic that the effects of the pandemic and its spread were best understood in the context of space and time. That's kind of the soundbite that, that encapsulates um, what we really wanted to do as a community. But while we saw front page news, we turned on the TV and we saw GIS dashboards, the geospatial industry was generally not being asked for our most meaningful contributions. I don't want to um, uh, disparage any of the great work that people were doing. There were pockets of great work and those dashboards were wonderful, but we had so much more that we collectively wanted to give. And that really um, brought us to um, uh, this idea that we can go beyond the visualization and we can really start to provide an understanding of the factors that influences influence the variations that we saw in any phenomena uh, around the pandemic, a spread rate, a vaccination rate, those sort of things. Um, I had a, uh, I have almost never lost sleep over work, but I woke up at four o'clock in the morning early on in the pandemic, and there was an outline in my head, like this lucid outline of exactly what a statement ought to, um, ought to convey. And so I jumped out of bed, ran downstairs. Normally I couldn't get out of bed at four o'clock in the morning without knocking my water off my nightstand, but I fired up the computer and started hammering away. And that really became what others um, latched onto and did a lot of nice editing for a joint statement. I'll share a, uh, a little screen shot of that so you can grab a, um, uh, grab a screenshot and that will be right there. Um, these uh, slides will be provided and there's some more uh, detail there as well. So the joint statement was, was um, really just outlining the importance of uh, and the value of GIS in understanding uh, the pandemic. 11 organizations uh, signed on with us. And then we jumped in and, and really created this uh, pandemic GIS task force. And the task force was really bringing together some interesting organizations. The National Association um, of, Public, of Public Safety GIS, uh, URESA, Urban and Regional Information um, System Association, NISJIC, um, I'll, I'll put in some, um, some representatives there. If you think about what we did there, is we had the, those that are managing GIS for emergencies, those managing GIS at a local government level, and those that are coordinating GIS activities at a state level. So we really had a cross section uh, of people that ought to be uh, really plugged in. Once we got our act together and we had our, our feet under us, then we invited in the public health organizations, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and the National Association of County and City Health Officials. So that really became a strong team. Uh, that um, fired up that task force. So you're putting all this together and you're trying to figure out where this fits. You know, what steps did you take to better understand where to plug GIS into the pandemic response equation? Yeah, that's a really good question, Dan. Um, so this, um, some of that information is encapsulated on the, on the um, website that I have up on this slide. Um, we did some hot washes, hot washes, um, 
or kind of after action, but in this case, it was still during the action report where we got people from lots of sectors together, the GIS folks, the data folks, public health folks, um, uh, and um, firsthand um, uh, public health providers. And we asked a whole bunch of questions and we, we pulled them together. We put out some surveys, all that is listed here. I'll give you one sound bite. Uh, one of the questions was, what was the factor that was the biggest impediment to you being the most effective in, in uh, solving the pandemic in your, in your role? By far, 70% of the participants, said the number one impediment was lack of available data. All right, so we had a, a kind of a good focus there is like, what are the pediments? Why aren't we um, getting the data in the hands of the people who can use it um, the most? So, so you're out there gathering all this information through hot washes and surveys and, and even reports. Is that what led to the creation of the pandemic JS playbook? Yep, it sure did. Can you share a bit more about that playbook and what it contains and how it can help us as GIS leaders or, or health leaders? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the playbook um, intentionally is incomplete. It is intended to be um, uh, the tip of the iceberg, the conversation starter, and the thing that brings people together with the right kinds of questions. So um, the, the audience can, can understand how to um, engage with different uh, resources that they're going to have around the, around the country. So it's really a lot of those things that we wished we were asked as the, as the GIS community. But then it goes a little bit beyond that. Um, it's, it's really this, this um, juxtaposition of protecting public health while also protecting privacy. And what are the spatial implications around that? Things like data aggregation, for instance. So you're starting to put all this information and conceptualize what that playbook needs to be. Who's the audience for the playbook? That yeah, it was really in your thinking. thinking. Absolutely, um, and that kind of morph, uh, uh, morphed, and we we had a lot of uh, energy in, in talking about that. So, the audience really was uh, in in three uh, in three groups. Um, it really becomes um, intended for those that are managing the health emergency, and that's both in emergency management and in public health, and those that are uh, deciding on data policy. And that could be public health officials or elected officials uh, in the case of a pandemic. And then secondarily, the audience is the GIS community um, and the folks like the statisticians. So we're on the same page, expecting the questions that might be asked of us. So you're bringing those audiences together in the playbook. Can you take us through some of the highlights of the playbook? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we've been throwing the term around data governance, and data governance is one of those terms that, uh, frankly, I have to admit, uh, has taken on a new meaning for me. It used to be some, something I, I avoided. It seemed like something that was in my way of getting my work done. But now uh, it's taken on this new, um, uh, this new meaning for me, where we each can contribute the part of the data solution that we're best able to contribute, and then we can rely on the work of others because we understand it and it's available to us. So that data governance really is one of the things we, we kind of get at without really saying it in the playbook. Um, for instance, the public health data, uh, if I'm in public health and I'm trying to manage data to understand the variation and spread, for instance, well, I can just focus on the data that is in my wheelhouse and that is maybe um, spread rate, right? Or it, it records around um, testing or uh, records around vaccination. And those records start as records about an individual, so those ought to be behind the firewall, right? But uh, little little tidbits like, all right, when do you think it's the best time to get the address right? When should you validate an address? Well, the answer is as far upstream as you can. For instance, when someone is making an appointment for their um, for their COVID test, that would be the perfect time to send that address to a geocoder and get back a result to say, yes, that's a valid address. We know we've got it. Or here's a correctly spelled formatted address. Is this what you mean? Yes. Yeah, so you start to build that data quality on input, even though that data is still about an individual and must be protected under HIPAA. Now wow. you start to take, take that address data and you aggregate it to some unit of geography and 
now you now you have characteristics that are no longer about an individual but about a, a geographic area so now it sounds like you're in the realm of geographers yeah absolutely and that's really where we where we come in and 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 i would it would not be reasonable for a public health official to think that i know everything about public health nor would it be reasonable for me to assume that um on top of a public health official's mind is the difference between aggregating by zip code county or census tract and for instance if you were aggregating data to zip code well unless you were carrying a mailbag and wearing blue shorts zip code's not for you right zip code doesn't align with anything else there is no authoritative source of zip code polygons um, post office has carrier routes and it's for delivering mail um, fraught with problems there other um Another aggregation point is the county. And in the case of Vermont, where they had travel restrictions based on the county that a person was coming from, if you're in these counties, please wait till the spread rate goes down in your county before you're welcome to come to our state. Um, that made sense to aggregate by a county in that case. But when you really want to get to understanding the neighborhood characteristics and the changes area to area that we're seeing, or the variances, I should say, um, in the phenomena or vaccination rates or spread rate or even um, uh, hospitalization rates, uh, census track is really kind of that sweet spot. Makes sense. I did notice in the playbook that it references census tracks in a, in a few places. Why is that? Well, it's, it's pretty interesting that the census track is a unit of geography that's small enough to really understand um, the characteristics of a neighborhood. Census tracts are larger in rural areas and smaller in urban areas, and they try to bring together roughly equal numbers of people. And census tract is the unit of geography that the Census Bureau uses to protect privacy while also publishing data on the American Community Survey. So it makes sense now that if the public health folks are managing data and aggregating it to census tract, they automatically then have a raft of other information about that same unit of geography that might help to explain the variance, language spoken, ethnicity, income, employment. Um, there are uh, even the prevalence of comor co comorbidities, right, um, is available commercially at census tract level. There are people that had the tough choice to make. Do I have a choice to feed my family or, or social distance, right? I mean, I'm in the kind of job I have to go show up, right? So those characteristics are borne out. And the good news is, if I'm in public health and trying to manage that, I don't have to manage census data. Others have already done that for me. I can just aggregate my data in a way that ties to it and I'm good to go. So that begs the question then, did any states publish their data, their account data by census tract? Yeah, they, they did. And um, hats off to uh, first Wisconsin and then Louisiana. Um, they did publish uh, data by census tract and I talked to, I found and talked to the people that um, were responsible and were managing that data and asked, just like um, Shelby said, you know, you've got to know what the con is. You've got to talk, you know, what the, what the dissenters um, might have a different opinion and respect that. I asked, were there, was there pushback? And the answer was across the board, no. In fact, in some cases, they were asked to make even higher resolution data available. Um, so uh, it was pretty interesting to, uh, to see that once that data was out there, people saw the value in it. Yeah, as we did in my own state in Minnesota, we began to to summarize by census tract as well, and that allowed us to attach it to a lot of the demographic information that you mentioned above the ACS survey and some of that, that even the social vulnerability information to help decide for us at least where to put test sites or where to put vaccination sites so that we were serving all populations. Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned going beyond visualization. Give us an example of, of really what you meant by that. Sure, and going beyond visual, visualization is um, really gaining uh, an insight into what's happening. And one of the methods that uh, became pretty popular was um, uh, testing uh, for COVID RNA in uh, wastewater. Um, and if we if we under one if if we know, okay, uh, we take a sample at a sewage treatment plant and there's this level of, of COVID. Well, what geographic area and what are the people, who are the people that that represents in general? Well, you can collect um, that geographic area by understanding the property parcels. 
And then you can take assessment data on those property parcels and say, okay, these are the people that are not included in that sample because they're on um, a private septic system and you wind up with um, the sewer shed, right? And then you can lay together public works data of the actual geographic location of the sewer network. You can start pulling manhole covers and testing further upstream and have smaller and smaller sewer sheds. SUNY ESF, one of the institutions that, um, uh, that was working on this, um, did just that, and they determined that there was a COVID outbreak in one of their dorms before anyone had symptoms and before anyone got tested, and they shut it down, right? So that's just a great example of, we didn't need to visualize all that, we just needed to understand um, and, uh, and take action. We further uh, take some, uh, the, the playbook dives into some spatial statistics idea, and we don't have a lot of time to get into that, but just to, to whet the appetite there. If you take a spread rate, for instance, and then you compare it to a whole bunch of other variables, you can find out through spatial statistics what percentage of the variance in spread rate is explained by each of those variables. And then you can come up with a mathematical formula to predict the spread rate if characteristics were the same in a different area that hasn't experienced it yet. And then uh, one additional piece to that is the mobility data, really the movements of cell phones. Um, in aggregate um, also uh, was one of those factors that really, um, as people moved around, that had an influence um, on the spread rates. So there's some, uh, some data available, uh, available and some examples of one of the ways, kind of a conversation starter around that. I can see that as you think about uh, the needs and the data, and now you're starting to bring all this together, it's starting to tell a story. Um, and, and the task force really helped to bring that together. Uh, what do you think will be the end result of the work of the task force? Well, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And that's one of the things that is, um, we're kind of silent on in the playbook. And one of the reasons that, um, uh, that uh, meetings like this um, are really important. I think we're already seeing it. And I think we're gonna see a, a much deeper connection between the public health community and the geospatial community, not just around a pandemic, but around all matters of public health that have some spatial um, content. Um, and I also hope that we see that um, those connections move up in the organizations a level or two. So it goes first with the practitioners that are working together to get the geocoder right or to get the, the data all worked together. But then in the higher levels, so we, the, the folks that understand the providence, the importance of making certain data publicly available so researchers can, can do their thing, you know, that understanding will only um, bear out as we, as we make more deposits in those relationships. Very similar to what Shelby was talking about earlier. That's great. And thanks for sharing that, that great background. Uh, let's take some time and, and see what the audience has in, in terms of questions for you. Audience, go ahead and please add your questions to the to the chat, and we will read those back, and, and Frank will respond. While we're doing that, Frank, I, I know you have a little story about a local GIS manager in line for a vaccine. Tell us more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was a great story. Um, uh, yeah, so in in Long Island, um, uh, a friend of mine was in line, and he he had spent all day every day managing data around the vaccination rate and trying to help um, tune all that. And the folks putting out the vaccines early on were doing their best to get needles in arms. A friend of mine who's a disaster epidemiologist uh, had a great quote. He said, um, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. They have to go into people, right? So, um, so this friend of mine was in line um, and he overheard the woman ahead of him say, oh, you don't have my address right on the form. And the pharmacist said, oh, that's okay. We're not going to mail you anything. And I'm surprised he didn't lose his mind, you know, but he, he bit his tongue, not the right time and place. But they told me that story because that pharmacist was playing a role and playing a role that he thought was, was correct in, in getting vaccines um, done as quickly as possible, but wasn't aware of his role in the data supply chain and how having the right location address would enlighten and we could get to those underserved areas. We can understand um, how to get um, more effective vaccines because the data was also of value. And that's, that's a piece of the supply chain that was missing. 
Great story. And, and one that you wouldn't normally think of as a, as a pharmacist, right? The right. important role that that correct address plays. We have a question from our audience from Nicole Eden in Arizona. What was the COVID data aggregated to tracks made publicly available in Wisconsin, um, Louisiana, and Minnesota? Yeah, that's a great question, Nicole. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the aggregated uh, data was made available um, in Wisconsin and Louisiana. I'm not sure about Minnesota. Dan, what's uh, was that publicly available in Minnesota? Well, I left state service before the pandemic was over, but I do know that we had all of the data available by by tracks, and we were looking at that, especially in terms of social vulnerability. I don't know if it was publicly released. Uh, that would be something I would have to look into. Yeah, the interesting thing is um, on on that is um, anytime we try to predict who will do amazing things with data, we always fall short. When we make data publicly available, there are people that latch on and do all kinds of wonderful work with it that um, I wasn't plugged in enough to even anticipate, right? So as long as that data is now aggregated to a point that satisfies your compliance office um, with your regulations, um, letting it rip is actually, it's actually easier to manage the infrastructure for publicly available data than it is to manage the infrastructure to protect um, that which has a, a more limited audience. Thanks for that. Another question from our audience. Uh, this comes from Shelby. Frank, don't you think a pandemic is a strong catalyst for having a shareable national address file? Yeah, that's a great question. And one I had um, uh, hoped to, uh, to get to. Thanks, Shelby. And we didn't even plant that question ahead of time. We probably could have. Um, so what is happening, what has happened uh, since the pandemic is public health officials are reaching out to their state um, GIS folks, and they're figuring out what the best geocoder. So I send an address, I get back a coordinate is a state at a time, right? Um, many of those states are also contributing the raw information, the existence of an address to the national address database. I know in New York, we're making seven to 10,000 edits a week on streets and addresses. Well, picture running a, um, a nationwide pharmaceutical chain, and you also are contributing in, um, in testing or in vaccinations. Wouldn't it be great if you had one nationwide source to go to, one nationwide address geocoder, where you could validate the same addresses in Arkansas as you, in the same way as in New York? So that's one of the important use cases for the National Address Database and a geocoder sitting on top of it that's freely available. We just say, send your addresses here, you'll get that correctly spelled, located, and uh, well-formatted addresses. So absolutely, let's add that to the use case. From Sheila Mara in Arizona, many times the data we are discussing are sensitive and therefore getting departments to share them is a challenge. Do you have suggestions on how to address those challenges or suggestions on how to start building relationships between government departments before there becomes a need for a shared data? Seems to fit right in with the purpose of the task force. Absolutely, and, and that's a great question. And I think you're on to the, on to the right answer um, there. By the time the TV cameras are running and the issue is front page news, um, especially in our divisive media um, and divisive politics that we have now where, where um, folks are throwing rocks, that is not the time to address those questions. It's during peacetime. It's during time when we're kind of on a decline. You know, COVID is still with us, um, but um, this is the time to start thinking about, okay, um, Here's an, a record about an individual. Here's a record of, about the characteristics of a thousand individuals in a geographic area. Um, by the way, the same sort of thing, like there are census demographic data on teen pregnancy, right? Nobody wants to publish information about an individual pregnant teen, yet teen pregnancy at a census geography level helps um, people decide how to uh, and where to put in the, the, um, the uh, facilities to, um, to assist that that um, those people, not those individuals, individuals as we're um, as we're protecting individual privacy while also public health um, in aggregate. So there's some there's some um, certainly some great examples of how to 
um, get rid of the very low numbers. Say you just have a couple of um, cases in a census tract. Maybe you have a threshold where from one to five cases, we're going to call that five so that if there's two, somebody couldn't reverse engineer and figure out those two. But there's there's methods to be used. And I think a, the biggest part of, of those um, discussions are really showing the benefit of um, how we can have a faster response, we can include more people, and we can set the policy once and set it and forget it and just know this is we're following our policy, here it is. And during the emergency, now we don't have to figure all that out. Agreed. I know in my state, Frank, that this was a real educational opportunity for the health community to be able to see that data in a different way and, and really watch the pandemic progress in a different way. It, it was much more visual, but really what it did was it, it opened the door for the relationship between the two organizations. Just something that I wanted to share because it was really an eye opener on both our sides to understand health data, you know, from the GIS perspective and on the health side to understand how, how viewing data spatially and even as the data progressed, you know, because data was changing constantly, was it provided them an, a whole new view of what was going on um, across the geography out there. Here's a question from Bob Nutch in, in North Dakota. Thanks for, for reaching out, Bob. Are you aware of geospatial educational opportunities having been provided at national health care epidemiologist conferences to help build awareness of using geospatial technologies? Um, yeah, that's a really good question, Bob. Um, uh, one of the um, groups that I plugged into is uh, the AASHTO uh, recently created um, GIS community of practice. I say recently, um, post the beginning of the pandemic. So there is a, a public health focused nationwide organization that sits alongside NISJIC and they've got a GIS community of practice. And in fact, I think if that community of practice had been in existence at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we probably would not have spun up the task force. We would have plugged in with that effort, right? So um, so that's an ongoing um, uh, group that meets um, pretty regularly and a uh, good one to plug in with. Um, and I know that um, at many of the public health um, conferences that have happened throughout the pandemic, and um, you know, we are seeing GIS presentations. Um, I've plugged into a, to a few of those. It's been kind of neat. One really positive side of being, I was NISDIC president at the time. Um, uh, during the pandemic, when all the conferences went virtual, is I could attend a bunch of them. So um, short answer is yes, but uh, check out that uh, ASTO uh, community of practice. Thanks, Frank. Uh, we only have about 30 seconds left. In the last 30 seconds here, Frank, any final thoughts you want to leave with this crowd? Yeah, um, I really think that um, we have created the relationships through the task force and then through outreach like this, where we have the folks representing the states, local government, um, and emergency response GIS folks, and they are plugged in um, and have a mechanism. If you don't know who your GIS folks are in, in a state, it's right there on the NISDIC website. If you don't know who your public health folks are in your state or in your local government, you've got ASHDO and, and NACHO. So the mechanisms exist for us to have those conversations. Like Shelby said, make a deposit in those relationships. And that's, that's what this is about. And I really appreciate um, uh, any folks that have joined us and a bunch of uh, have joined us for this from public health. Um, welcome aboard, right? And let's, uh, Let's continue to, to uh, do good work together. Great, thank you for that, Frank. Uh, so much appreciate your time today, as well as Shelby's. Uh, to our audience, again, thanks for sticking with us and, and uh, participating in, in the conversation through your questions. Have a great day.